Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining our panel today, uh, Driving Innovation Through Emerging Technology with HBO. Um, you know, if technology wasn't already accelerating in the face of human behavior. I think we're well within a supercharged seat right now. Um, as the audiences and the technology we, we use, you know, evolve in utility, and as the entertainment landscape itself evolves, we want to understand where all these intersections are. We want to understand how to develop meaningful successful consumer experiences through emerging technology and HBO have led the charge with these stellar breakout innovative marketing experiences. So today we want to spend some time doing a deep dive into uh, their approach to innovation. How do emergent technologies advance the art of storytelling? You know, how do you drive impact in the marketing space? So we'll get some background on these on recent amazing experiences and of course um, hopefully get some insight as well to what's next. Um, I'm Bu Wong. I'm the Global Director of Emerging Technology for The Mill. We're a creative production studio. We work with brands and agencies to define and execute on innovative strategies uh, and experiences. And that's exactly why I have worked with this wonderful group of panelists and why I find myself in the sweet spot of moderating this group today. So before we dive into all the groundbreaking work that you're doing, um, I'm sure we'd all love to hear uh, a little bit about each of you. Um, so maybe we can take a couple minutes so you can tell us about yourselves. Um, you know, I'm gonna, uh, Dana, can you tell me a bit about yourself? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, zooming in from frigid New York City and wishing that we were all in Austin, Texas together. But um, to introduce myself, I'm the Vice President of Program Marketing at HBO. And um, my tenure at HBO has been about eight years of overseeing, um, you know, creative marketing campaigns for shows like Lovecraft Country, which we'll talk about today, as well as Big Little Lies, Curb Your Enthusiasm, Insecure. Um, and I also have a special place in my heart for Silicon Valley because that's kind of where I cut my teeth um, along with Sarah on the emer emerging tech space. Um, so really excited to talk today. Uh, Emily? Hi, how's it going? Um, I'm Emily, yeah, I'm Emily Janusa, a VP on the program marketing team at HBO. It's so great to join you today, Boo, and all these amazing panelists. Um, I will say that I echo Dana's sentiments. I do miss Austin and the sh amazing street tacos, but South by Southwest, the show has to go on, right? Um, so what do I do at HBO? Uh, my team handles 360 campaign oversight. Um, so that's the creation of all creative materials, such as posters, digital and social content, uh, multi-platform media campaigns, and digital and real world activations and promotions. Um, campaigns that I've led include Westworld, um, I May Destroy You, Euphoria, and His Dark Materials, which we're going to talk a little bit about today. My passion is storytelling, and I love connecting fandoms to the shows they watch on HBO in authentic ways. Um, I'm just really excited to, to join these panelists today to talk about HBO's approach to innovation and how we use emerging technologies to further immerse fans into world, the world of the shows that they love. Awesome. Um, Kathy. Hi, uh, I'm Kathy Davenport Lee. I'm the VP of Interactive Design at HBO. And so we um, we work across all the different titles at HBO and Cinemax and also a few HBO Max titles as well. Um, um, but yeah, so basically I work with Emily and Dana and Sarah on many of these campaigns and my team um, creates digital marketing materials in-house. Sometimes we work with agencies and oversee them. And we have around 29 different creatives who have different specialties and backgrounds. Um, yeah, I mean, I think everything, um, God, I, there, there's so many things I think that are cool about the types of content we have at HBO, but I would say, um, along with Emily, I really love interactive narrative, interactive storytelling. Um, and I'm just, I'm just really psyched about all of the cool things that we've been able to do in the spaces of AR, VR, mixed reality, um, assistant voice space. Um, and I'm just really excited for whatever is to come. Cool. Excellent. Um, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Also zooming in from New York City. It's great to virtually be here with all of you. Um, I am a director within the marketing team, and my focus really is on emerging technology production and strategy. So I've also been at HBO for almost eight years, which is crazy to think about. But um, And I've worked for um, with most of the people on this panel for many years. So 
I'm really excited to be here with all of you and chat about emerging tech because it really is my area of focus and passion. And again, echoing these guys' sentiments, you know, being able to create immersive and interactive experiences for some of the most impactful programming in the world is, you know, a dream come true. So really excited to chat. Thank you, Boo, for facilitating this conversation. Yeah, and thanks for joining us. I mean, I love hearing about like all of your different backgrounds and the teams that you that you lead, you know, and you all get together to to make these amazing experiences. So you know, it'd be good to I would love to know about that. Like how do you all work together? You know, do you all sit down together at the start? Like, does it start with the campaigns? You know, you, Emily, I don't know if you have a thought about that. Yeah, yeah. Happy to take that one and break down the process. So just taking a step back and looking at who we are and how we collaborate. So HBO Program Marketing is an interdisciplinary team of campaign strategists, editorial um, content specialists, interactive designers, and um, emerging tech producers. Um, I will say that collaboration is at the heartbeat of everything that we do at HBO. And when it comes to emerging tech projects, it certainly takes a village. So looking at emerging tech projects, how does a bill become a law, right? And it all starts with planning. It is so important to plan early um, just because you need time to strategize the technology pairing with the IP. You need time for a creative brainstorm. And last but certainly not least, you need time for development. So looking at, um, we like to start sort of like a year out with our marketing leadership team. And we take a look at all the upcoming shows, right? And we ask ourselves, what shows naturally lend themselves to immersive world building? I just wanna pause and also say that we love all our children, all our shows equally at HBO, um, but we have to make some tough decisions here. And the factors that go into the decisions are, does the show have a built-in fan base that's immediately gonna evangelize the experience and want to try it and spread the word? Is it a genre show? Usually sci-fi and fantasy shows like Lovecraft Country, um, Westworld, Game of Thrones, His Dark Materials, those fans want to go deep and immerse themselves into the narrative. Is there a plot line that naturally lends itself to an emerging tech storytelling extension? Also, sometimes our showrunners pitch emerging tech ideas, which is always an amazing collaboration point, which I think Dana is gonna talk about later. And last but not least, is there a cultural or technology moment or trend that we can tap into that makes sense for HBO and the IP to be a part of in a compelling and innovative way for our fans to engage with? So once that's done and we earmark all the shows, we then move into the individual campaign team kickoff process. Um, so continuing to break this down, some couple more steps, bear with me. Um, this is the process where we really break off and we define the e-tech objectives for each show and then the stories that we want to tell. So each pillar represented here like plays a major role in this process. So my pillar, program marketing strategy, we set up an initial kickoff meeting. And this is where we make sure that everyone on the team is aware of the campaign strategy, the objectives, and the audience that we're going for. Everyone needs a firm understanding of all of these elements. So we're all walk, working towards the same North Star here. My team also makes sure that we're armed with all the show materials so we can become subject matter experts. So we make sure to distribute script, showrunner notes, start of production notes, anything that can help add some juices to the creative ideation. Last but not least, there's the brainstorming part of it, which is my favorite part. And again, all the pillars still collaborating every touch point. And during the brainstorm, this is where we really dig deep to define the e-tech goals, potential story points, and last but not least, what is the desired consumer response that we want uh, when our fans engage with this experience? Um, Sarah's team, the emerging tech production team, they sit in on these meetings and they take the objectives and the story points and they translate them to tech opportunities. Like, could this be an AR experience? Could this be mixed reality? Could this be VR, social VR? You name it, we just kind of put this all out, lay it on a piece of paper to see what is the best technology pairing to go with the story. Kathy's team makes sure that any visuals that are paired with these technology platforms live up to the high quality of HBO's production value. So just making sure that everything looks good and stays true to the fidelity of HBO's programming. Um, last but not least, we have our editorial content team, big shout out to them. And they're really like our, our subject matter experts of each show. They know the shows in and out and they make sure that any kind of stories that we want to tell match up to the narrative that fans are watching on the screen. Um, they're also super helpful when it comes to guiding agencies during their ideation, just to make sure that we're staying true to the tone and world of the show. So once we all align, we then put together a creative brief for an agency to help us flesh out the concept and then put together a development plan. 
I just want to take a minute and say that it's so great to get outside thinking from agencies because um, more great minds are brought to the table and also they have skill sets that we don't necessarily have in house at HBO. So big shout out to the mill who, who created the Lovecraft country sanctum experience with us and also frame store who um, created the his dark materials my demon um, Apple watch and iOS companion so bravo bravo to you both you're fantastic partners. So once we receive the pitches we get to the concept approval phase. And we meet as a team, we look at them holistically and we refine, and then we put it through our marketing leadership team, then our programming team. And last but not least, we then send the idea to the showrunner. After that, the real fun begins and we head into the development process. Oh, cool. I mean, that, that, is, <laughs> that is so much. I feel like that needs like its own like kind of three week session on how the hell that gets all put together. <laughs> I'm happy to lead it. I'm happy to lead it. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, but I did pick up on um, Dana, I think, right? Like, uh, you know, those like kind of, kind of, how do you, how do you collaborate with your showrunners? You know, is there a way they, they all have different IP, different priorities? Like, how do you work with them? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, I do think we need to just say a quick hello to Sarah's dog, Rudy, who has been popping in and out. He's a very innovative thinker, so um, I think he'll have a lot yeah. to contribute to the conversation. Um, but yes, um, relationships with our showrunners are absolutely paramount at HBO. Um, you know, I think that's for a few reasons. Like one, the secret sauce of why HBO is what it is, is that we work really closely with our talent and, um, you know, it's, it's a true partnership and that's how we're, you know, able to attract the Michaela Coles of the world or the Misha Greens of the world. Um, and then I think also, you know, when we're talking about working with showrunners, um, it's very critical to us to make sure that every single touch point from a marketing perspective feels extremely authentic to the series and, um, you know, the overall uh, creative uh you know, behind the show. So um, whether that's like something as permanent as the key art for the show, whether that's something as imper impermanent as a social post, um, or, you know, as we're talking about these immersive digital experiences, we want to make sure that every single detail um, really feels like it's up the world of the show. Um, and so in practice, like every once in a while, you get a showrunner who is super keyed into the stuff and is really excited about digital storytelling and just wants to like make every single decision and look at every detail with you. But, you know, more often than not, our showrunners are very busy with their day jobs of actually creating the show, um, especially when you're talking about shows like Lovecraft Country that have significant VFX and, you know, things come together a lot in post. Um, so, you know, oftentimes we'll work with a delegate on their team, whether that be a writer or sometimes there's even someone on the production that has the specific role of transmedia producer. Um, and we work hand in hand with them to kind of guide the conceptualization of whatever we're working on. And so for Lovecraft Country and Sanctum, which I think we're going to delve into quite a bit later. Um, we worked with a writer on the staff named Shannon Houston, who is absolutely brilliant. And basically we ran every single detail, every single nugget of the experience past her just to make sure it was up to snuff and really represented the show in a way that they could be proud of. Awesome. You know, and, and, you know, to that, you know, you brought up Sanctum, like Sarah, like what is it about emergent technologies, you know, that, that, lend themselves best to entertainment marketing strategy. You know, there's so much new tech out there. How do you evaluate like what to pair with what show? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it, it's obvious based on what Emily and Dana said, but if, if you've seen a marketing campaign run by HBO, you know that the team, specifically this team is in just relentless pursuit of the most innovative audience engagement tactics. And really what that gets us is you know, an opportunity to reach the target audience where they are um, at the right time. And so the role of emerging tech as we see it within a larger campaign is to reach those audiences in innovative ways, but also really provide extraordinary value to our fans. Um, our goal always is to create content experiences that are more immersive, more interactive and more personalized because we, we just see you know, that as the way of the future. And so really leveraging emerging and creative technologies in content projects allows us to do that. 
Um, and ultimately the, the main goal is to create a deeper connection between our fans and the IP. Um, Cause really that's what it's all about. Um, and, you know, we're excited that we get the opportunity to do that in really interesting, exciting ways. Um, and we think it builds a lot of brand loyalty in addition to kind of the, the things we're always after, which is buzz and awareness around the programming. Awesome. Um, and sorry. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just going to zoom. Um, I, what I was just going to say is in, in terms of evaluating um, which technologies make the most sense per title, um, as, as Emily mentioned, it's a pretty involved process and a very collaborative one at that. So um, we take a very audience centric approach and really what we're looking at um, when we're sitting down with these teams is um, kind of a couple of things. One, the creative pillars of a show. What are those hooks that we can sink our teeth into creatively that will help us tell a really interesting story that will resonate with fans? Two, audience insights, making sure that we know who our audience is on a really intimate level um, and identify ways that we can reach them and satisfy them. And then three, as always, always looking at business objectives and goals. And so those three things really drive what our tech pairing becomes as well as um, you know, the, the overall creative strategy for the experience because everything that we do really is rooted in strategy and insight so that again, we can create the most impactful experience that's authentic to the show and the way that HBO tells stories. Right. And, you know, it's like you're talking about kind of like understanding like the scale of it and also, you know, how it, uh, you know, connects into the overarching uh, kind of marketing experience, you know, uh, Kathy, like you oversee, you know, mm -hmm. from my understanding all the creative, the creative teams that the um, interactive design, I think, group at the at HBO. Mm -hmm. So I would love to get your thoughts on that. You know, how do you, how do you consider scale or how does this connect into um, an overall strategy? Yeah, um, I mean, that's a great question. It's something that that Sarah and I have like talked closely about through the years. Um, and I just, it it's so crazy how fast everything moves in the technology landscape. I just, I remember just like three or four years ago, there was one Snapchat lens for, for Game of Thrones and it was like the only one that was done all year. Um, and, and then, you know, fast forward to 2020, there's a show that we did this year that had six, um, just in one <laughs> show. Uh, so, yeah. So, I mean, I think it's, it's really important to me because I like, I'm so excited about all of the, the big swings that we can make. Um, and we need to be strategic about like, like looking at things that can be scaled, that can be brought in house and done so that we can conserve our energy for like the things, you know, the, the Lovecraft and the historic material kinds of projects that are kind of really big, um, interesting swings into this landscape. Um, and I think it's really, it's really important to, to plan to push the envelope because if you don't um, actively do that, you're, you're just behind, you're just catching up. Um, and it's, uh, you just like sort of lose the battle with like trying to break through. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think like my team is sort of in, in the business of like helping to create assets that break through and, um, yeah, because we, we sort of have the ability to scale some of these things. We look to, um, we look at things that have been like tried and tested, um, and used to be a big swing. And we think about how those can be scaled up. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so as far as working with partners, obviously like we work with, um, the mill awesome partners frame store. Um, and I think like, you know, we really see them, um, the, the partner as like sort of the, the expert in the field. Um, and we try to just, um, keep cohesivity, um, of all the campaign elements, because we're kind of looking at all of them. Um, but while like sort of like allowing this this other space and then um, kind of building around it. Cool. And you know, like this year has been quite a year. Um, and you know, we've we've you know you know at the mill, like my team got to think outside of the box with you guys, you know, and like create a series of you know uh, groundbreaking like social VR experiences with you. You know, and in consideration of that, you know, where we've all found ourselves this year at home, it would be really good to like dive a little bit into how that affected your approach to understanding your audience. You know, how do you design in, in anticipation of where you're going to be finding them right now? You know, for us, we worked with you, we made escape rooms, art installations, you know, even a, a virtual concert, you know. Um, you know, maybe, you know, Dana, like, can you tell us a bit about, about Lovecraft Country from your perspective? Like, how did your approach to, to marketing the show change, you know, once we hit, 
you know, early last year. Yeah, I mean, um, I feel like this is going to be a popular refrain for, for any South by Southwest panel that people are tuning into this year, but um, certainly come March, April of last year, it was like one of those situations where it's like, okay, every single plan that we have, let's <laughs> you know, control backspace and start start <laughs> fresh. So um, actually with the case of Lovecraft Country, we had been working on the campaign for over a year. Um, the show had been in development for a long time. We knew it was gonna be a huge priority for the network. And, um, you know, we had all of these plans, again, like control backspace, had to kind of start fresh. But um, as you were saying, like, I think there are, some insights that can come out of like the way people are behaving during these days. So I think we had a little bit of an epiphany moment um, in our pivot, for lack of a better term, um, in thinking about like what spaces we could fill for people that they couldn't experience because of lockdown. So um, the idea of using emerging technologies like VR and social VR to give people opportunities to travel to a different place or to have a communal social experience when they couldn't was really attractive to us. And also like travel and community happen to be really important pieces of the Lovecraft Country story, um, which you learn from moment one when you, know, you see Atticus on the bus. Taking this insight, um, Together with the mill, the fine folks over there, um, we came up with Sanctum, which um, basically like it was couched in the concept of a VR secret society, um, which took, borrowed that idea from the show, but obviously the secret society we were creating was far less evil um, than the one that you see in the series. Um, but when you kind of boil it down to what it actually was, um, it was a tastemaker event series. Um, so for three events throughout the course of the season, we invited 100 influencers to join us um, and we shipped them Oculus Quest headsets um, to their homes. And um, we held these events that were basically experiences inspired by the episodes that they had just watched. So um, the first event was an Afrofuturist art exhibition um, where we had these amazing artists actually recreate their artwork in VR. Um, it was such an impressive experience. Um, the second event was a spoken word poetry performance by Journey Smollett, who's the amazing actress um, who plays Letty Lewis in the show. And um, she performed a poem that was written by Shannon Houston, who uh, I mentioned before um, and was inspired by the words of James Baldwin. And then our third event at the end of the season was this amazing finale celebration concert by um, literally the perfect artist, Janelle Monet. Um, and that happened to be her first concert performance in VR. So that was pretty cool. Um, but I think also what made this experience so special was that what it ended up being was a showcase for Black art and Black artists um, during what was really a critical inflection point in the cultural conversation. Um, and so throughout the course of the events, we built in all kinds of like interactions and fun games and puzzles, as you mentioned. Um, but we also wanted to infuse the show in every single thing that we did. So. We worked, you know, in addition to Journey with Jonathan Majors, Courtney B. Vance, Michael K. Williams, all the stars of the show to provide VO, um, which I think lent a very special quality to it. Um, and basically the way that it worked was we hosted these events in private worlds on the platform VR chat. Um, but since we were limited to the 100 people who were given headsets, we also live streamed, you know, a feed of the event to the HBO YouTube channel for anyone else who wanted to tune in. And we even like put interactions in the YouTube live streams to make sure it wasn't just a passive experience. Um, so people could solve riddles and kind of affect the experience that they were seeing. Cool. And you know, like as far as you know, emergent technology goes and kind of the the difficulty or the challenges, shall we say, not difficulty, uh, you know, the trickiness, the challenges of onboarding, like how did you approach getting an audience for this? You have a hundred influencers. <laughs> yeah. how, how did you manage this? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we were certainly limited by the amount of headsets that we could procure during um a time where everyone it was like 
the headsets were sold out everywhere. Um, and so, you know, we, we came up with this number a hundred. And um, so we wanted to make sure that the, the recipients were influential voices in their own respect. And so, um, you know, we pulled together a list of folks from across various different touch points, you know, the blurred community, which were really strong um, proponents of the series from the beginning, gamers, um, cultural critics, tech press, and, um, you know, I think the first criteria was that we wanted to make sure that they were fans of the show or, you know, demonstrated that they like shows like that, um, but also wanted to make sure that they would really appreciate the technology and the programming of the experience, um, because we basically were counting on them to show up every, you know, three weeks or however uh, long it was between the events itself. Um, and then in terms of onboarding, I mean, Wow, that was, that was definitely a thing. Um, you know, VR is not always the most intuitive for people who, who don't have a lot of experience with it. And we had a lot of newbies on the list. Um, but then in addition to that, you know, you had to think about factors like, all right, we're shipping these headsets to people's homes. We're counting on them, you know, having a strong Wi-Fi connection. We're counting on them to remember to charge their headsets before these events. <laughs> Um, and, you know, remember their username and password. And it's, it, it's a little bit different from when we would do these kinds of experiences, you know, IRL <laughs> in real life, um, because you could have like a docent there to help people through any issues that they were having. So um, knowing that like literally getting people there was gonna be critical to the success of the events, um, we actually built a team over at the mill to deal with like all of the, you know, user journey stuff from everything from crafting these like amazingly extensive instructions that came in the box for the Oculus Quest to writing and answering hundreds of emails from a Sanctum dedicated inbox to like a text helpline that we actually set up during the events just in case every, anyone was like having immediate issues. Um, and, you know, like even with all of these precautions in place, we still had our fair share of issues on, on the user level. Um, and I think like one big learning experience that I had was just like, if you're working with these technologies, in the, especially in the middle of a pandemic, like you just kind of got to let go of the idea that everything is going to run without a hitch. And ultimately, like everyone was really forgiving. Like we gave them this really amazing experience for free. Um, so they were cool with their makeup sessions and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, that was, uh, that was definitely a big hurdle that we had to crawl over um, in order to make Sanctum a success. Excellent. I, you know, and besides, you know, our, our confidence and our kick-ass proposal to do this you know, <laughs> on, on a social VR platform. I mean, you know, Sarah, we work so closely with you on this. Like what, what, what were the factors, you know, from your point of view that led you to saying, all right, we're going to do this social VR thing. Yeah. I, I mean, the amazing proposal certainly helped. Um, but no, like Dana touched on this earlier, but you know, the technology and the platform decisions were really driven and inspired by the times that we're living in. Um, coupled with the fact that, you know, Lovecraft Country has such strong themes um, that we felt like we could really realize in a beautiful way um, using VR. And so we, we really felt like the title lended itself so well to just this big, bold form of immersive storytelling that, you know, we're not always able to explore with um, other titles. So I think, I think a bunch of factors went into it. One, just, you know, the rich world and narrative that was crafted by Misha Green and the show. Um, the fact that social VR hasn't really been heavily exploited by marketers yet. And so we really felt like this was a great opportunity to build buzz and awareness around the brand as well as around Lovecraft. Um, another, another really strong factor again was you know, just wanting to transport people into this world. And so we felt like VR as a medium really lended itself to allowing people to fully envelop, be enveloped and immersed in the world. Um, it, it's very different from other technologies. And while there are some drawbacks, VR really allows you to do that in a fun and, and interactive way that gives you some agency and a space. 
Um, and finally, again, as Dana mentioned, you know, we really, you know, we started thinking about this in the summer. So we were well into COVID but at this point. And so we really wanted to create an opportunity and a space for people to be together. And social VR offers a really wonderful opportunity to, you know, allow people to feel a sense of presence. And if you just, if you think about right now, even still, if you think about being able to go to a concert with a friend, it, it's almost unimaginable. So mm. giving people the space and the tools to be able to experience something like that was really special and really important to us. So a lot of thinking, a lot of, you know, debating, a lot of deliberation went into, you know, determining this was the final route that we wanted to go, but we really feel like it was the right choice. Cool. And, you know, um, Kathy, like, you know, with the, with the show having just really distinct uh, a world, right, and art direction, like, how did you, how did you ensure authenticity, you know, to the source material, you know, and what, what were some of the coolest experiences, you know, from your point of view that, uh, that, that were made? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we definitely like, it was a real partnership with the mill to ensure the authenticity, but I think the, what, you know, what really worked about it is we created this well-defined um, space that felt a little bit similar to the world that Hippolyta discovers um, in I think the seventh episode um, but then it's sort of like we sort of like ex expanded from there um, and it felt like this really hopeful space which is kind of what you get from that that episode and that part of the series and um, it, it, it like the whole space kind of felt like a reclamation of this like science fiction genre and I think that's why VR was so cool for this because you could really go to a fantasy, um, fantasy sci-fi action kind of place. Um, so I, I think that's where like, you know, the, the authenticity in it felt like it, it, it reflected like the, the spirit of this series, but at the same time, because we weren't, um, you know, tying it to exact storylines directly, except, you know, in certain places, which I can go into, um, like, I think that's why it, um, aligns so well, um, but yeah, like having said that, uh, it's really it's really hard to pick a favorite because I, I have a lot of favorites. But I think if I had to narrow it down, I'd say everything about um, the concert piece with Janelle Monae was really cool. Um, so like for for those who are kind of watching this panel, I just want to describe um, uh, Janelle Monae had an avatar and she had this like really amazing dress that from a distance, it looks kind of like a moving mosaic pattern. And if you go up close, you can kind of see that there are moments from the show kind of reflected and moving on it. Um, there's this really surreal landscape that changed and, and like reacted to the music. It's hard. It's like, I want, I want to like show you so badly. It's so cool. Um, <laughs> and um, there are also these like, um, I thought, I thought there was just like a lot of thoughtfulness in the micro interactions of like, there were glow sticks and lighters that you could kind of play with. Um, um, if you're an audience member and you could sort of like draw things with the lighter, you know, for each one of the three main events, there are all those kinds of like micro interactions. And I think that was really, um, that was really cool. And it gave, it also gave people who were experiencing it together, something to kind of talk to each other about. Um, so I really love that. Um, I also like to the point of it being aligned with the narrative, there were some really specific pieces that were added um, that, that reflected the content of the episode. So there's um, an interaction called the abyss that the mill did um, that was very like um, very much the scene from episode four where they're going through that hidden vault under the museum. Um, and you, you know, as a user, you are walking across this very scary um, drawbridge into like nowhere, <laughs> it feels like. Um, and it was just a really cool, um, moment of immersion. Uh, there's also the escape room interaction, which is based on like the basement from episode three. Um, the characters are dealing with a haunting, like a haunted house basically. Um, so it, that's, that was a really interesting thing as well. And again, it, I think it was framed perfectly to get people to interact with each other and be collaborative. So I think what, um, you know, when I think back, the parts that I loved about it so much were that we didn't just say like, here's a, here's a, um, a concert and like, and then call it a day. There were kind of all of these moments of reinforcement that helped it be like a social experience on a different level and a different medium. That's so. super cool. And like, I mean, I could talk about Lovecraft Country Sanctum all day. 
But <laughs> <laughs> I will say also, Emily, that I love the uh, AR app that you developed for His Dark Materials for season two. Um, it was awesome. And it you know, worked for Apple Watch and iOS and like having your own personal demon was such a good idea. And you know, it's connection with wellness, especially right now, it was a very shareable experience. Um, can you tell us about it? How did you arrive at this idea? Look, we're really proud of the My Demon app and what we built there as well. But before I dig deeper into the audience insights and the consumer trends that really led us to this idea, I just want to take a minute to talk about the His Dark Materials fandom because it's really thanks to them that we created this um, and a couple of social listening insights that we gleaned at the top of the project. So to start, His Dark Materials is based um, on the popular book series by Philip Pullman, and it has a really diehard fan base. Um, those fans want to immerse themselves in the rich narratives of the show. And after doing some research in season one, um, we saw that the demons are the most popular aspect discussed on social media. Um, so just giving you a His Dark Materials 101 for a second, a demon is an animal-like manifestation of your soul and they always accompany their human. Um, so a lot of fans express their desires to have their very own personalized demons. And thinking about where we're at um, in, this, in this pandemic, you know, what better time to give this to our fans and grant that wish as a source of comfort and wellness. Um, so ahead of season two, we partner with Framestore and they actually do the, um, the, the VFX for the show and, and they're, they're fantastic to work with. And we created a scalable, high quality, one of a kind AR app um, for iOS and Apple Watch that allowed for the creation of personalized demons with some wellness benefits. It allowed you to go on journeys with your demon, themes from plot lines in the show, but it also layered on some wellness activities that strengthened the mind, body, and spirit. Um, so the creation of the app was rooted in a couple more key insights. So as I mentioned, there's a popularity of the demons um, and fans desire to have their own. And then also our attachment to our smartphones. Um, in the world of the show, the demons rarely leave their human side. So to create that symbiotic relationship between fans and their demons, um, we thought to ourselves, what's the one thing that we always have with us? It's our phone, right? So it felt natural to us to create an AR app that allowed for daily demon interactions um, that felt natural to the user um, and building those bonds. The second insight was we tapped into surging trends around wellness and self-care during the pandemic. We really saw this as a way to storify health and wellness. And it was just kind of like, it was not just about like bringing fans closer to the narrative, but it was about building a bond with your demon through daily interactions. Um, the app connected to Apple Health and Spotify for a more personalized experience that not just was for entertainment purposes, but it tapped into user behavior. So it suggested specific activities um, such as meditation, um, reading, simply reaching out to a friend, some exercise that were really tailored to the user while also encouraging them to dig deeper into the world of the show. Last but not least, there was scalability and shareability. So all of us as marketers on this panel today said, the pandemic, we had to be flexible. Yes, we had to be very flexible with this. And we had to pivot a lot of our plans. So initially, um, this was a concept that we imagined for New York Comic Con. Um, but in the wake of the pandemic, we knew it was important to create an experience that was scalable and could reach as many fans as possible. So we also wanted it to be extremely shareable. So it was so easy to share your AR demons to social, download videos and photos and text them to your friends. And it was such a joy, like my team and I, just seeing all the demon interactions being shared with fans remixing their reality uh, mm -hmm. with AR demons, like working from home with them or with their pets, like fan creativity really exploded there. And that was one of my favorite parts of the app. Cool. You know, and you mentioned uh, about the personalization, you know, um, you know, Sarah, maybe, um, you know, this tapped into uh, Apple Health, right, and Spotify too, like, how is this app built to to understand the user? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the personalization element was really important to us from the beginning. Um, if you've seen the show, and as Emily just explained, you know that your demon is literally a, a piece of you, um, and it represents your soul. So it was extremely important to us to manifest that connection authentically. And so, you know, the personalization piece really starts when you open the app, you are 
um, given a series of, of questions. So you go through a personality quiz that basically, you know, gleans insights about the user and um, uses them to inform the demon, which demon you get, what texture, skin, fur pattern do you get, and what their personality is like, which was really fun. But, you know, we wanted to take that, um, that level of personalization a step further. And so we, um, we really tapped into Apple Health and Spotify. Um, again, we're not looking at, you know, very detailed uh, personal health information worth saying because we checked with legal, so everyone is safe. <laughs> but, um, you know, we, we're measuring things like mindfulness minutes and physical exercise minutes and, you know, reading minutes. So we're able to glean a lot of information through Apple Health, which is really exciting. And then also Spotify, because we know um, especially this fan base, but a lot of people, millions of people all over the world use Spotify. So really what we wanted to do was, um, again, just strengthen that connection. And so every time you complete one of these activities, your demon dynamically understands that you've completed the activity, checks it off, and then, you know, it offers more curated responses moving forward. So um, it was really exciting for us to be able to do that. And I think, you know, fans really appreciate um, when used responsibly, data is, is really able to offer really personalized experiences, which is important to us in all of our emerging tech efforts. Cool. And, you know, the, you know, the demon behavior was like, and the app, like so in point, you know, so true to the show, you know, Kathy, like how, how was this designed? How did you keep the authenticity? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think with His Dark Materials, as with any show at HBO, I think the key is that we we set up a core team in the beginning, um, like leads who are passionate about the show or experts in the show um, content. Um, you know, in, in this case, for me, it was um, my lead was Tom Haskard, and there was also a content lead named Ashley Morton. Um, and they were, you know, they're really amazing. I think Emily already hit on this, but the demons are... It, it's a really special thing that is is contained in that narrative. Um, this is not a Tamagotchi. This isn't a cute little pet that you just like have in your phone. Um, it's it's you. It's your it's your soul. And it's like kind of your relationship with yourself. Um, and all those things again that that Emily mentioned earlier of like, you know your demon, your demon is connected to you. Therefore it cannot be far away from you. Um, you don't set your demon, your demon sort of, um, it changes and shifts when you're a younger person and then it settles when you get older. So like, like even that figured into the way that they crafted the personality quiz. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, like the, the idea that you don't necessarily, um, you're not like, going to pet the demon or anything like that. Like it's it's really um, a reflection of your soul. So they kind of started from that um, from that um, that narrative um, standpoint that was fixed and said, hey, like we want to make sure that every part of this feels like you're experiencing the show. Um, not that we're trying to do something different with it. Cool. So, I mean, it's been awesome hearing about these, you know, getting a bit of a deep dive into these two projects, you know, and it's like, I'd love to spend just a few minutes, like just talking about like, uh, you know, maybe grounding principles, you know, that HBO applies when you're designing these experiences. There's such a wide variety. And as we said earlier about emerging technologies, you know, how do you design in anticipation of that? You know, how do you actually, when, when the rubber hits the road, what is the, how do you maintain the art of storytelling and have that narrative art going? Right. Um, so, I mean, we we definitely like have well defined the e text or guiding principles. Um, but you know, we have like a few a few main points. So, we want to make sure that we're extending the vision of the showrunners. It's not a new story. We're not making new content or extending their vision. Um, the audience has to be right. I think both Dana and Emily mentioned this before, but the fandom has to be willing to go on this journey with us. Um, the the content has to be right. It has to support the this kind of um, ap application. Um, it, you have to be, um, we just talked about this in the last class, you have to be authentic to the to the show content itself um, because it is responsible for kind of continuing that narrative. Um, the strategy has to be right too. Like, um, I, I mean, I think 
uh, Dana's example of like all the thoughtfulness that was put into the influencers around um, the Lovecraft, uh, the Lovecraft example is great, is a great way of expressing that. There's just a lot of thought put into how does the world find out about this? How do we make sure we have the right like sort of ambassadors talking about it? Um, and that, you know, and, and is it going, you know, how do we define our objectives and are we, you know, how do we define success um, is something we really talk and think about a lot. Um, creativity is kind of a no-brainer. <laughs> I don't need to explain that. Um, but, but yeah, I think we're we're really interested in being um, in pushing the envelope and kind of being seen as like a leader in um, this space. Um, yeah, and then also just like the education of um, not only like our. Um, our teams, but also internal groups at HBO, because the more people understand what you can do with this, the more we can kind of like as a group move forward. Very cool. Yeah, and I, I also would just add, sorry, sorry to just jump No, go in, for it, but yeah. <laughs> I, I also would just add like, it's so important to remember that we need to design for the tech. Um, there, right. there are a lot of moments where there are really shiny new tech, tech objects if you will. Mm -hmm. And um, we really try to make sure that in, in the design process, we are focusing on the things that the technology does well so that it amplifies the storytelling in an authentic and quality way and sort of stay away from things that we feel might degrade quality in any way. So um, just wanted right. to add that little tidbit at the end. Right. Yeah, that's important. I, I think we definitely, we get into some real Sophie's choices sometimes. <laughs> like, you know, when we want to add like 10 more objects into the escape room and there's not enough file size or whatever. Um, <laughs> but no, like that, that's a great point. You know, and, and, you know, with that in mind, like how do you maintain like the, the storytelling aspect of it? You know, when you're designing anticipation of the technology, how do you, how do you marry those things together? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it, it is about like um, really being willing to prioritize and say, you know, it like if it's a if it's a social lens, you know, we may not be able to put every single demon into this social lens for his dark materials, or we may not be able to tell this story point, that story point, and this other one, but we can focus it on one um, and then kind of like tell the story of these other things in in different assets. Um, I think that's kind of the, it is it is again, just like about making choices. Um, yeah. So as you know, I'm kind of watching the time, I, I would love to end this on a kind of a couple of uh, lightning round questions, I guess. <laughs> you know, I think, and everybody, you know, we always want to know this, like, with all of this experience, right, and looking to what you're going to be doing next, like, what would you, what would you do differently? Um, I, I don't know, Emily, do you want to kick that off? Yeah, and I actually, I have my demon ah. who's been trying to Zoom crash, <laughs> so I'm just going to let him do it. This is Frank, but... I think that, you know, if we had more time, I would have baked in a couple more um, of the character journeys and plot related journeys. I think that, you know, super fans really got a kick out of that and encouraged them to check the app even more and unlock some more rewards and wellness activities. So if we had more time, definitely baking that in. And especially because it was an app that launched before season two. So it would have been a great way to tease that narrative. Cool. Um, Dana? Um, so I actually don't have a solution for this, but I feel like a quandary that we ran up against, um, for Sanctum was just like, I think anyone who was just listening to Kathy describe the Janelle Monet concert, like would love to be in that experience and immersed in that experience. And, um, I just would have loved if we could have opened it up to more than a hundred people to like really experience um, sanctum and its full VR glory because I think you know the YouTube stream was a decent solve for scaling it but you know anyone who experienced it first on YouTube and then went into the world afterwards was like oh my god this is so impressive and um, I think you know the reason I can't really come up with a solution for it is like I think there's just an innate tension in um, wanting to create something that's of the, like the foremost quality and on, you know, platforms that are high end um, versus like the desire to reach as many people as possible and working on platforms that are a little more democratized. So like at the beginning of Sanctum, we considered like 
Facebook spaces um, and some some platforms that were a little bit further reaching. But, you know, as Emily said earlier, fidelity to the series and the quality of the series is Mm -hmm. honestly more important in some ways. So, um, you know, I don't have a solution, but anyone who wants to see Sanctum, you know, after you get a vaccine, come over to my apartment and we'll, we'll check it out <laughs> in my quest. Watch out. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, um, so yeah, I would love to end today with like a, another lightning round question. Um, you know, as, as you know, storytelling and marketing innovators, like, you know, I'm sure everybody wants to know, um, you know, what you're seeing on the horizon. You know, what are your particular fascinations right now in the emergent tech space? You know, are there, what are the signals rising above the noise that we should all be looking for? Um, and uh, who wants to go first on this one? <laughs> Sarah, maybe, <laughs> or Emily? Sure, go ahead, Emily. No, Sarah, you go. <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> I'm punting because this is really hard for me. Um, but I would say I, I am incredibly excited and inspired about the future of XR as a category, especially with all of the really fun new devices that are coming out and being worked on right now. And just the the level of quality and fidelity that you can get with digital content these days is just getting better and better. Um, I'm also really excited by, you know, the AR cloud and spatial computing and think that you know, the concept of, of, of our physical world being a canvas for digital experiences is really amazing and would love to walk down the street with a favorite character or, you know, experience things like that, especially with our type of programming at HBO. Um, I also really think that, you know, we're going to see some interesting stuff in the wake of COVID-19 as it relates to just interesting interfaces and interactions and experiences that are generated um, and inspired by, you know, touchless interfaces and, 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 you know, the way that people are and are not able to interact nowadays. So I'm excited about that. Um, Yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of exciting stuff out right now. And just thinking about different inputs that could be appropriate for today's world is uh, really exciting. And I think technology is the way that we're going to solve for a lot of those challenges moving forward. Um, Emily. <laughs> yeah, well, Sarah, you aced that lightning round so that you're, you're a fact to follow. <laughs> but I, I will say that I'm, I'm a big fan of um, augmented reality for social good. Um, and I think Snapchat does a really simple and elegant job of doing that. Um, this, these are gonna, examples are from a couple months ago, um, but they did use the camera as a simple yet powerful way to unite their community um, to help during the COVID-19 pandemic and also have their voices heard during um, key social justice movements. So simple lenses like that registered over 1 million people to vote. Um, a lens that can tell you if you're standing six feet apart from someone, a lens that allows you to donate to the World Health Organization. And last but not least, they also launched this lens called um, Raise Your Voice, where it actually allowed the community to design masks um, that had powerful uh, messages um, about the Black Lives Matter movement. And I just think that, you know, Snapchat really harnesses their community and AR for social good. And I can't wait to see where they take it and other partners take it in 2021. Cool. Um, Kathy? I, I don't think virtual events are going away. And I think that the stakes are just going to keep getting higher. It's like, you know, like uh, the, the, the thing we did for Lovecraft um, is a good example, but like there's another um, whole talk show that was being done through Animals Crossing, um, Animal Crossing, the game. Um, it's called Animals Talking. Um, somebody like <laughs> staged an entire talk show. Um, and I, I think we're going to see more <laughs> things like that. Um, and in fact, there's a whole genre um, they're called like VTubers people who like kind of have a virtual 3d model that is uh is sort of like animated to look as if they are um real um and kind of commenting on things but it's like it's still virtual so i think i think virtual hosts and virtual events are still going to be part of our culture um in some way so i'm interested in that too i've really enjoyed working with you guys you know on a normal day and today it's been really amazing to have this time with you really special and it's been so insightful so thanks so much for being you know so generous and sharing your thinking and your process with us today like i think i can speak for the audience here that we can't wait to see what you guys make next so 
rock on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Boo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.